After Greg got home from school, he texted Hayley and Cyril, asking them to come over. While he waited, he looked at the latest text from Fetch. Too easy. What's too easy? Greg responded. AOTA. All of the above what? Greg asked. 411. All of the above information was too easy. What did Fetch mean? Was he talking about Greg's conversation with Kimberly? Was he saying that Greg was making the zero point feel too easy? And why did Greg care about the opinion of an animatronic dog anyway? He wanted to ignore Fetch, but then Fetch, Fetch texted R-E-G M2, or Me Too, I think. Fetch then texted a link to a website that sold small REGs. Greg didn't understand what Fetch meant by REG Me Too. Did M2 mean Me Too? Did that f mean Fetch was saying he wanted an REG too? Or was he saying he was an REG? Or like an REG? Greg frowned and texted back. Thanks. He figured whatever Fetch was saying, he should stay on Fetch's good side. Hedy and Cyril came over and bought pizza. Surprisingly, Greg's parents were home, but they were caught up in some intense discussion and they both said okay when Greg asked if his friends could come over with pizza. The boys spent their first 15 minutes wolfing down pepperoni pizza and guzzling coke. When Haley burped loudly, Greg decided it was time. We need to talk about what happened the other night. Do we really? Cyril asked. Yeah, Greg said. Fetch is out there somewhere. Well, now you're just being a moron, Haley said. That's what bothers you? That he's out there somewhere? Yeah, he's out there, for sure. Fetch is an animatronic. And you obviously managed to turn him on. But how about the fact that Fetch dug up the spider for you? Or the fact that he killed a dog for you? Yeah, there's that, Greg agreed. I think we should destroy it, Hades said. I think we should stay away from it, Cyril said. Yeah, but will Fetch stay away from us? Greg asked. Hades glared at him. You're the one who activated it. Greg threw up his hands. I didn't even know what I was doing. Well, you need to figure it out, Haley said. You're the smart one. Yeah, Cyril agreed. You sound like you're mad at me, Greg accused his friends. Cyril looked at his tiny feet. Haley said, well, you are mad at me. What did I do? You're the one who wanted to go there in the first place, Cyril said. Greg opened then closed his mouth. He got up. Fine. You two can head home then. I'll take care of it. Haley and Cyril stared at him, then looked at each other. Whatever, dude, Haley said. Come on. He got up and gestured for Cyril to follow. An hour later, wearing threadbare sweats and an old tie-dyed t-shirt lying on his back in bed in the dark, Greg said to the ceiling, I need money. If he had money, more money than he could get from babysitting anyway, he could get whatever he needed for his experiments. He could set up his own consciousness project then he'd know what to do about Fetch. Greg grabbed his phone. Over the summer, he'd read an article about this 13-year-old entrepreneur who set up a home business and was making tons of profit. Greg was 14 and he was smart. Why couldn't he have a business? He thumbed in a search, how to make money fast. He spent the next hour skimming through make money at home sites. By the end of the hour, he was frustrated, confused and tired. So he got ready for bed. Just before he laid down, he picked up his phone and sent Dare a text. I need the magic finger of luck. Can you teach me how to make money? Dare didn't respond. Greg figured he was probably asleep. Dare usually went to bed earlier than Greg did. Uh, before he turned off the light, his phone buzzed. A text from Fetch. Good night, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams to you too. Greg responded, ignoring the chill that skirted down his spine. He frowned, bothered by something, but he wasn't sure what it was. He was so tired, he wasn't thinking straight. He couldn't keep his eyes open. So, he closed them, and he was asleep immediately. When Greg woke up, it was still dark out. He erupted from the bed and blinked frantically to focus. His last text? What had he been thinking? Idiot! Greg grabbed his phone and deleted his text to Dare. Then he called Dare. No answer. He pulled up Dare's landline number and called it. Even if Dare was asleep, that phone would wake him. No answer. What should he do? 
Greg had no way to get up to, Gre to Dare's place on his own. It was too far to bike. No buses ran up there. How could he get to Dare and warn him? A ride. He needed a ride. From who? No way could he ask his parents. He thought about Mrs. Peters, three doors down. She was always nice to him. Maybe... Greg tore off his PJs and pulled on grey sweats and a navy blue hoodie. He grabbed his phone and ran out of his room. He wasn't sure how he was going to explain to Mrs. Peters why he needed a ride at... What time was it? He checked. 4.30. Well, he'd just have to figure it out. In his stocking feet, Greg took the stairs two at a time. Inside the front door, he stopped to tug on his rain boots in the entryway. Then he threw back the deadbolt and flung the door open. He started to charge through the door, but then he looked down. His legs went out from under him and he crumpled to the ground. He started to leave, covered his mouth, or start, sorry, he started to heave, covered his mouth and looked away from what lay on top of the welcome friends map. Oh, Matt, sorry. I don't know why I'm talking about maps. <laughs> Looking away didn't help though. The image was indelibly, indelib, in, indelibly <laughs> etched into his retinas. In his mind's eye, he could see Dare's thick finger, the base torn and bloody, part of the bone jutting through the gore. The finger was dusky and had tufts of light hair. The blood was bright red, even just in memory. The details were excruciating. Greg even noticed that the blood had congealed before the finger had been dropped on the mat because the white M wasn't bloody. Greg? What are you doing down here? Greg's mum was coming down the stairs. Greg didn't think. He snatched up the finger and stuffed it in the pocket of his hoodie. Grabbing the door frame, he pulled himself to his feet and shut the door. I think I was sleepwalking, Greg said. Lame. But he was too out of it to come up with something better. Then he noticed his mum was crying. What's wrong? he asked. Her eyes and her nose were red. Her mascara was smeared. Her cheeks were wet. She wore nothing but her pink fuzzy robe over a white frilly nightshirt. She wiped her cheeks and sank down onto the third step from the bottom of the stairs. What's wrong? he repeated. He rushed to the stairs and sat next to his mum. She took his hand. I'm sorry. It's not the end of your... Eh. <laughs> It's not the end of the world. I'm just shocked, is all. It's your Uncle Darren. Greg stiffened. You won't believe this, his mum says, sobbing. He got attacked by some kind of wild animal. It tore off his finger. Greg couldn't breathe. He looked down at his hoodie pocket. He put his hand over it, feeling the ring still wrapped around the grotesquely ripped base. When Greg had seen the finger, He'd have known it was Dare's even without the presence of the onyx and gold ring. But the ring? That, more than the exposed bone and reins, was what had dismayed him the most. Now his eyes filled with tears. He cleared his clogged throat and managed. That's terrible. He's all scratched up too, mauled. He's been airlifted to the hospital. I just can't believe this. Greg couldn't comfort her. He was too busy realising. Oh, no, 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 he groaned. His mother, not understanding, wrapped her arms around him. It's okay, really. I'm sure he'll be fine. He'll probably make a joke out of losing his finger. She burst into tears again. No, 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 Greg repeated. It was like a mantra, like he could say it enough and it would make everything stop and go back to the way it was. Disengaging himself from his mum, he touched the hoodie pocket and said, I need air. He ran to the front door, threw it open, and careened down the front stairs. It wasn't raining, but if it had been, he wouldn't have cared. He had to get away. He couldn't face it. He couldn't accept what he'd done. Because he'd done it. Obviously, he had done it. Greg didn't know where he'd been planning to go when he left his house, but before he could go anywhere, he was stopped in his tracks. Was that? Yes, it was. Under the shore pines clustered near the back of his yard, Next to the marron grass at the edge of the dunes, Fetch sat. His eyes glowed red in the now pre-dawn light, and his ears were tilted forward, as if in question. Greg was so angry and upset, he didn't even think about running away. Instead, he grabbed the baseball bat from his dad's pile of sporting equipment and took one step towards Fetch. Then another, and another, and then he was sprinting full out. Fetch stood, eyes bright, 
He looked at Greg. If Fetch had been a real dog, Greg would have thought this was cute. But Fetch wasn't a real dog. He was an animatronic killer made to look like a dog. Greg wasn't going to let the seemingly happy look stop him. When Greg fetched, uh, when Greg reached fetched, uh, oh gosh, when Greg reached fetch, he didn't hesitate. He swung the bat at Fetch's head. The first strike split open the top of Fetch's head, revealing a metal skull and ripped wires. Sparks flew as Greg wound up for another swing. What did you do? Greg screamed at the Fetch. Fetch's mouth hinged opened. What? Fetch's mouth hinged opened in what looked like a silly grin. It's a weird sentence. Uh, Greg swung the bat and whacked Fetch's mouth. Metal teeth sprayed out and more sparks sputtered at the end of the wires that hung through the mouth opening. But Fetch was still looking at Greg with what looked like an eager gaze. Stop it! Greg shrieked. Swinging the bat in, an, in a wide arc, he brought it down on Fetch's head as hard as he could. Metal clanged, more sparks flitted out into the wet dune grass, and Greg kept up his assault. He pounded on Fetch with the bat. Once, twice, three times, four times. Finally, Fetch's face was pulverised. But Greg wasn't done. He raised the bat again and battered what was left of the machine. Soon, the remnants of the animatronic killer didn't resemble anything but a small pile of industrial debris. Still, Greg didn't stop. Not until he had blisters on his palms, and he was chomping at the sea air in frantic, wide-mouthed gulps. Finally, he dropped the bat. Greg fell back on his butt in the sloppy, wet dunes. He stared at the pile of metal, hinges, synthetic fur and wires as he sat, catching his breath. The surf was loud, its rhythmic roar like the chant of a million angry men. To Greg, it was the sound of judgement. It was his accuser. How dare he think he knew enough about the field to think about luck and expect to get money? And what was he thinking when he texted Dare about the magic finger of luck? He was the one who'd been wrong. How could he blame this on Fetch? Fetch might have been like an REG machine that he seemed to be reacting to Greg's thoughts, but he wasn't an REG machine. Was he? Greg didn't understand what was going on, but he thought that Fetch was responding to more than just his texts. Somehow, Fetch was observing Greg's actions, and maybe he was even reading his thoughts the way Greg's plants did. Fetch wasn't the zero-point field, but he was part of it. He seemed to be acting like he was the field's dog or something, getting whatever the field thought Greg wanted. Whatever Fetch was, it was Greg's fault that Dare got his finger torn off. Greg, you out there? Greg's mum called. Greg looked at the destroyed animatronic. Greg? His mother started down the steps. Greg and the debris were partially hidden in the marron grass, but if his mom came into the backyard, she'd see them. Greg looked around and spotted a dep uh, uh, and spotted a depression under the driftwood log covered with Fetch's teeth. He quickly shoveled all of Fetch's parts into the hole and called out, Coming! His mum wanted Greg to know Dare would be in surgery for a while to repair damaged nerves and sew up his lacerations. It would be some time before they could go visit him, so she was going to work until then. She hugged Greg before she left. His dad was already gone. As Greg went inside, he realised he'd left the house without his phone. What if someone had been trying to reach him? Someone. Let's get real. He meant Fetch. Had Fetch sent him a text before Greg had spotted him? Yeah. Fetch had texted. Or oh, Fetch had texted. Greg discovered when he reached his room. Fetch had asked Greg how he was going to use the magic finger of luck. This question put Greg into a fetal position on the bed, and it brought on a fresh wave of tears. Kimberly's words played on a repeat track in his head. He's going to crash and burn before he figures it out. Crash and burn. Crash and burn. Crash and burn. Greg sat and, uh, Greg sat and up and yelled, No! He grabbed one of the books from his nightstand and he fired it at the biggest plant in his collection. The plant went flying off the shelf and dirt exploded into the air. Greg snatched up another book, threw it. Another book, threw it. He did this over and over until every one of his plants was on the floor and dirt was everywhere. He breathed in the musky scent of the damp earth. He laid back down and tried to calm his breathing. This brought the tears back, but that was okay. He laid there and cried until he fell asleep. When he woke up, the sun was dropping in the west. 
It was mid-afternoon. As full consciousness returned, he remembered everything. What a complete tool, he berated himself. What had he been thinking? Did he really believe he could figure out what no one else, not the CIA or the universities or the experts, had figured out? If it could be done, wouldn't it have been done? Such an egotistical little twerp he'd been. He realised now he, how little he knew and that meant that whatever he thought he knew, whatever he thought had been the right thing to do, could have been exactly the opposite of that. Was he really guided to the restaurant or did he come up with the lame idea himself? And if he was guided, what guided him? He'd assumed he was doing something to get him what he wanted, but when his phone rang, he froze. Then he realised he was being stupid. Fetch didn't call, he texted. Greg looked at his phone. It was Hady. Hey dude, you okay? You weren't at school. Greg stared at his destroyed plans. He'd forgotten all about school. He'd forgotten all about life. Yeah, something happened to Dare. What? Is he okay? Dude, I'm sorry. Greg could hear Haley talking to someone else. Cyril says he's sorry too, Haley said. Thanks. Can we do anything? Not unless you can do magic. Sorry to disappoint, dude. Yeah. Hey, I'm not sure it'll make you feel better, but Kimberly was looking for you just now. Greg sat up and finger combed his hair, catching himself and rolling his eyes. It wasn't like she was in the room. Really? Totally. She said you have a good paper idea and she's ready to work on it. Right, the paper. He slumped. He'd been so excited about that and now he didn't even want to think about the topic. Still, if it meant spend spending time with Kimberly, he noticed Haley was talking. What? Sorry. I said, after, listen after listening to you moon over that girl forever, it would be nice to see you with her. It hasn't been forever, just since second grade. Had it really been that long that he'd loved Kimberly? Whatever. Yeah, it would be nice to see her. Well then, don't miss your chance. Call her and get busy on that paper. Win her over, dude. Greg grinned. Then he frowned. He felt wrong to feel hopeful after what he had happened to Dare. I gotta go, he said. Sure. Let us know if you want to hang out. Okay. Greg put down the phone and went to take another hot shower. He stank of sweat and salty sea air. When he got out of the shower and got dressed, he picked up the phone to call Kimberly. That's when he saw a text from Fetch sent five minutes ago. It said, we'll retrieve. No, Greg groaned. Greg shoved his phone in his pocket and tore out of his room. He galloped down the stairs and out to the dunes. Would Fetch even be there? When he reached the edge of his yard, he slowed. He was almost afraid to look, but he had to. He edged into the dunes and he looked under the driftwood log. Greg's legs gave out. He sank to his knees in the wet dune grass. Although a, a few small screws, metal pieces, wires and a hinge were strewn out under the log, the vast majority of the scraps were gone. Gone. Greg looked around. The only footprints he saw in the sand were his own. But the sand did tell a story. Around the driftwood, the wet, the wet sand was grooved with ragged drag marks. At least a dozen smears stretched out from under the log. And then they angled toward each other until they formed one messy drag mark that ended at a flattened clump of dune grass. Greg struggled to his feet and backed away from the dunes. Turning, he galloped into the house and up to his room. There he sank to the floor and put his head in his hands. Snapshots of the, late, of the last several weeks flashed through his head. The spider, the dead dog, the torn up dead dog, Dare's severed finger. All Greg had wanted was some luck. He didn't want his uncle's finger, but Fetch obviously took things literally. Greg had no doubt Fetch was active again. How? Greg didn't know. Didn't need to know. He just did know that Fetch still worked. So if Fetch interpreted his request for luck as a need to rip off Dare's finger, how exactly would he retrieve? And more importantly, what or who was Fetch going to retrieve? Especially now that Greg had beaten him up. No. Greg jumped up and stuffed his phone in his pocket. Shoving his feet into black running shoes, he flew out of his house. Kimberly lived about a mile away, further south, on the same street he lived on. It would be a straight shot. Grabbing his bike, Greg pedalled hard. Of course the wind was picking up again, and it was coming from the south. His lungs were screaming by the time he'd gone halfway to, his ho to her house. He ignored them and pushed on. He had to reach Kimberly before Fetch did, if it wasn't too late already. When he reached Kimberly's house, he leaped off his bike and prepared to rush up to the door, but he caught himself when he realised the house was dark. 
No cars were in the driveway. No one was home. Kimberly had mentioned her mum usually picked her up after school, and they often stopped to run errands on the way home. If Kimberly was still at school when Hayley called, Greg probably beat them here. Greg leaned over to catch his breath and picked up his bike. Carrying it to the bushes at the edge of Kimberly's yard, he, he hunkered down to wait. He considered searching for Fetch, but he didn't know when Kimberly would get home, and he could miss her if he was off looking for Fetch. He couldn't risk it. He waited. While he waited, he tried to calm himself with yoga breathing. It didn't work. He was so tense by the time the sun started going down at 4.30, he felt like his limbs would break if he tried to unbend them from his crouched position. He figured he'd better try to move now before Kimberly got home. Just as he started to stretch out his legs and stand, he spotted headlights coming up the street. He bent low again. The car went past, but before he could straighten, another came after it. This was the one. A dark blue SUV pulled into the driveway. The passenger door opened and Kimberly, wearing jeans and a cute green top that matched her eyes, bounced out of the car. She was chattering to her mother as she did. I think if we put the oregano in, it would be good. Maybe with Basil too, her mother said. Tall and slender, with a pretty face and short greying black hair. Mrs Bergstrom was in her mid-sixties. Uh, when they were in second grade, Kimberly told him her mother was 51 years old when Kimberly was born. I was a miracle baby, Kimberly said. I figured that means I should be nice to my parents. She laughed her musical laugh. Greg knew Kimberly's dad was even older than Kimberly's mom. He was retired. He'd owned a couple of hotels in Ocean Shores, and he'd sold them the year before. He mostly plays golf now, Greg overheard Kimberly tell a friend. Greg had met both of the Bergstroms. Although Mr. Bergstrom was a little grumpy, Mrs. Bergstrom was nice. But would she listen? Greg, re Greg prepared to step out of the bushes and tell Kimberly if she was in danger, but he realised how insane his story was going to sound. Maybe if he could, just, he could talk to just her, she could convince her parents to listen. Before he decided what to do, a black sedan pulled in behind the SUV. It crunched over gravel strewn across the asphalt driveway, and Mr. Bergstrom got out. The wind picked up speed when, uh, just when Mr. Bergstrom's feet hit the ground. It blew off his red baseball cap and Kimberly skipped after it. Thanks, sweetie, Mr. Bergstrom called. He smoothed down thinning white hair and hugged his daughter. The ocean wasn't as loud now as it had been that morning when Greg was running in the dunes. Was it seriously just that morning that he had found out about Dare and tried to destroy Fetch? It, it felt like a year ago at least. Even though it wasn't as loud, the ocean's insistent murmur drowned out what Kimberly and her parents were saying as they walked toward the house. Greg started to rise again, still not sure what to do. Just as he rose, Mr. Bergstrom's hat blew off once more, and he strode after it. The hat landed right in front of the bush Greg hid in, and Mr. Bergstrom spotted him. Hey kid, what are you doing in the bushes? Mr. Bergstrom's voice was strident and, and sharp. Greg squared his shoulders and stood up. He had to try to warn them. Hi, Mrs. B uh, uh, Hi, Mr. Bergstrom, he said. Who are you? No, wait, I've seen you. Greg, what are you doing here? Kimberly called out from her front walk. She came to, uh, she came toward Greg and her dad. Mrs. Bergstrom followed. Um, Kimberly, I know this is going to sound crazy. What's going to sound crazy? What's the meaning of this? Mr. Bergstrom snapped. Greg took a deep breath and dove into his explanation. Kimberly, you're in danger, like serious danger. I think, well, I think someone, uh, something is going to try and kill you. What? Mr. and Mrs. Bergstrom erupted into unison. Uh, Mr. Bergstrom's tone was rough and outraged. Mrs. Bergstrom's tone was a high-pitched shriek of fear. Kimberly said nothing, but her eyes had widened. Kimberly, you know what we were talking about? The REGs, the plants, the cells, the shared consciousness, the guidance... She nodded. I have no idea how to explain this, but part of the guidance I got was that I know how I know what was inside that abandoned pizzeria. So I got Cyril and Haley to break in there with me with you what? Mr. Bergstrom sputtered. Greg ignored him. And we found this animatronic dog that's designed to sync up with your cell phone. Mr. Bergstrom tried to interrupt again, but Greg talked louder and faster. I was curious, so I poked around at it, and I couldn't get it to work. Or at least, I thought I couldn't get it to work. But apparently I did, because it's been texting me and doing things for me. 
At first it did helpful things, but then it started doing things I didn't want to do. It killed a dog that bothered me. Kimberly, a dog lover, Greg knew, sucked in her breath. He shrugged at her. Yeah, I know. It was awful. I mean, this was a horrible dog, but still, it was a dog. And, and the way it was killed... And, anyway, I, then I was doing some... I was wanting some luck, and my uncle had this magic finger of luck, and I wished that I had that too. And then I found his young man, Mr. Bergstrom shouted. Craig ignored him and talked even louder. I found his finger, and so this afternoon I said, well, I said I wanted to be with you, and now I'm afraid Fetch is going to... Young man! Mr. Bergstrom yelled. Greg stopped because, well, what else could he say? That's when he noticed Mr. Bergstrom put a cell phone to his ear. Yes, could you please send an officer to my home? Some crazy teenager is stalking my daughter. I want him arrested. Greg looked at Kimberly. She mouthed, sorry. He shook his head. He'd failed again. When the police officer questioned Greg about breaking into the restaurant, Greg kept telling himself Kimberly would be okay. She was fine now, and if Fetch was following what was going on through Greg's cell phone, he'd surely know Greg wanted Kimberly to be left alone. I'd forgotten all about that old pizzeria, the middle-aged cop said when Mr. Bergstrom reported Greg's break-in. Is it still there? Is it still there? Greg thought. Was the place like Brigadoon or something? I have no idea what Brigadoon is. <laughs> it's a funny name, though. Uh, when the police officer put Greg in his SUV and took him to the police station, Greg kept telling himself Kimberly would be okay. Her parents would be on guard. Fetch wouldn't be able to retrieve her. But no matter how often he told himself everything would be fine, he dreaded going back to his house. It took two hours for the police to process him and question him. It took another two hours for the police to locate his parents and another hour and a half for, for them to get to the station because they were both in Olympia. What if Fetch had gotten to Kimberley in that time? His parents finally showed up at the station. His mother red-eyed and his dad pissed off about, well, everything. The police had decided to release Greg into his parents' care. He'd be free, which also meant he could keep an eye on Kimberly. As soon as his parents went to bed, he'd sneak out and go watch over her. He'd do that for as long as it took him to find Fetch and figure out a way to deactivate him. Greg almost couldn't bear to get out of his dad's pickup when his dad pulled it into the garage. Dragging his feet, Greg reluctantly opened the car door and stepped out onto the concrete. He cautiously approached the stairway leaning up to the front door. Then he steeled himself and looked around. Everything seemed normal. Kimberly's body wasn't under the house or on the front mat. He nearly fainted in relief. What the hell's wrong with you? Greg's dad asked when Greg sagged against the stair railing. Nothing. When Greg and his parents entered the house, Greg's dad grabbed Greg's arm. Greg gritted his teeth. I'd say I was disappointed in you, his dad said. But I haven't expected anything good from you in years. Greg's mum sighed. Stephen, Hillary. Greg ignored them both and went up the stairs to his room. Peeling off his clothes as soon as he was in the darkened space, he went to take yet another shower. He stank again. Not only did the hard bike ride and the panic to save Kimberly make him sweat buckets, he'd sat in what smelled like dried urine in the cop's SUV. He thought the hot shower might bring him back to life. He had to get the energy to go to Kimberly's house again. His bike was still in the back of his dad's pickup. The policeman had stuck it in his SUV when he took Greg in, and he'd given it back when he and his parents left the station. But when Greg got out of the shower, he was wiped out. He looked at the time on his phone. He also checked for texts. Nothing. That was good, right? Maybe he could take a nap before heading to Kimberly's to be sure she was okay. Heck, maybe he'd been wrong about the whole thing. Maybe Fetch was retrieving him a snack or information he hadn't even realised he requested. Maybe there really was nothing to worry about. Greg pulled on a yellow t-shirt and a pair of grey flannel sleep pants. Then he threw open the bathroom door. Barely containing a scream, Greg stumbled away from the door and fell to the tiled floor, his mind struggling to accept what he was looking at. There was something wrapped in a sheet, laying across the doorway. As he stared, the once beige sheet was turning a deep, dark red, and it glistened wet in the room's muted light. Who was under the sheet? What was under the sheet? Greg couldn't get himself to move so he could find out. Greg didn't need to look any further. He knew everything he needed to know. The phone on Greg's bathroom counter vibrated. He couldn't help himself. He picked it up and looked at it. Fetch had texted, see you. I think that's it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I like that. 
Uh, it's a it's a pretty average story, I'd say. Uh, let me know what you think about this story. I think it's really good. Uh, I think the the ending could have been a little bit better, and it's kind of weird that Fetch is like, see you, like he's gone now. I feel like it could have had a different ending, even though it was kind of like, whoa, so Kimberly was was killed. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a good story, I think. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. I like I like the concept a bit a lot where like fetch is a what is it a zero point field and like <laughs> it's it's like very scientific and like fetch would like act genuinely like fetch whatever Greg wanted uh, it it seemed a little bit kind of surreal but I guess that's what you're gonna get with these stories uh, but I liked it I, I it was a cool concept I think it could have gone further but it didn't. But uh, it's it's nice, yeah. So uh, let me know what you thought this story, uh, and yeah, that's that's all I really gotta say. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. We're gonna be doing Lonely Freddy next. This is the second to last story I need to record, so I'm excited about this. Uh, so yeah, tune in next time. Subscribe, like, do all of that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye. <laughs>